or shall we get started? Okay, let's get started then. So, uh, most of you have met me. I think I'm Mark Hallam. I'm going, I'm the uh, module coordinator for this module, and I'm giving uh, a series of introductory lectures. Um, the title of this lecture is Pathogen Biology. Just to, before we uh, get into the lecture itself, just to explain that the, the idea behind this module is that we're looking in kind of two dimensions at uh, the molecular basis of bacterial pathogenesis. We're looking at specific pathogens in some of the lectures, and in some of the lectures we're looking at concepts, mechanisms, and systems. Um, and having this kind of two-pronged approach, uh, we hope that you'll get a, a good feel for the subject and get to uh, understand how those concepts, mechanisms, systems work with specific pathogens and use specific pathogens to illustrate the concepts, mechanisms, and systems that you might come across. So the two approaches we hope will be mutually reinforcing. I should stress that all of us teaching on this course are bacteriologists, so we're not immunologists, and we're kind of a bit partisan. We're going to take a look at what the bacteria have uh, in terms of systems for causing disease. And we're not really concentrating on the host response and inflammatory responses and that kind of stuff. Um, maybe in the future, we're getting a new institute of microbiology infection, we might start being able to bring in a bit more of the host response. But for now, we're actually focusing on the bacteria. So just to set that out, because some people have commented in the past that they wanted, that they, were, they were surprised that there wasn't more of that. Now, one thing I also have to say in terms of housekeeping is that I, we just noticed in the last 24 hours that the timetable that was actually put onto WebCT by the office was, was not the most recent version. So this is the most recent version here. So I'm giving these three lectures. I've also made a, a lecture swap there. So uh, the last of my introductory lectures will be actually preceded by the first of the tuberculosis lectures. That's just because uh, I've got to go to a conference. But uh, in, the, in the, the thing that's online, there was some, for some reason, there were some lectures missing from uh, Luke Alderwick. I'm not quite sure what, what happened there. Um, so if you go on to WebCT, you'll find the most recent version of the timetable. So these introductory lectures, this is the first of three, but this is called Pathogen Biology. Then I'm going to give you a talk about genetics of bacterial virulence, regulation of bacterial virulence. Um, and then later on, you're going to get stuff on genomics and protein secretion. I should say, just uh, at this introductory point, uh, all the lectures will be recorded, are being recorded, as with previous modules. They'll be put onto YouTube as slidecasts. There's also a Facebook site for the module where we can uh, inform you of up-to-date things going on new papers that have come out that might impact on some of the topics we're covering. If any of you have questions or things that you want to raise for the class, then feel free to use that Facebook module or page. Okay, so what are we looking at to do in this lecture? Well, at the end of this, we sh you should be able to master the jargon, have an idea about how virulence is a multifactorial uh, phenomenon, outline some of the steps that are involved in a successful infection, and describe some of the varied macromolecules implicated in virulence. So let's just start, I mean, perhaps setting this a bit low. We've probably had some kind of talks on this before, but just to, to get these things clear, bacteria colonize body surfaces. So we're all covered in bacteria on our skin. Uh, the lining of our bowel is covered in bacteria, airways, and so forth. And uh, for most of the time, these are mutually beneficial arrangements, so-called commensal. Uh, arrangements, and so we call these commensal organisms. Uh, and on mass, all those commensals that live on us constitute what we call the normal microbiota. In the past, people used to call it the normal flora uh, when they classify bacteria with plants, but we're now a bit more sophisticated than that, so the term microbiota is preferred. So what is infection? The infection is a condition where the pathogenic microorganisms penetrate the host defences. Um, and get into tissues and start multiplying within host tissues. Now, it's worth stressing there that it may not be clinically obvious that someone has an infection. So we make this distinction between obvious disease and subclinical infection, where the infectious processes are going on, 
cellular level and, and level of tissues, but the individual is not aware that they actually have a problem. Um, the term pathogens it applied to microbes that cause infection. Um, again, we just to, to the definition in terms worth stressing that, in fact, you, if you're carrying pathogens, they may not always be causing infection in you. You can have a carrier state where you are colonized with a, an organism that is pathogenic, but in your situation, it's not causing disease. But it presents, still presents a risk to you if it gets into the wrong place, gets into the tissues, or may represent a risk to other people who have different immune status and so on. And then finally on this slide, worth just stressing that uh, some pathogens are what we call opportunistic. So that individuals in this room would not be susceptible to those pathogens. They're no risk to us as normal individuals with normal immune systems uh, and with host defenses that are intact. But in compromised individuals uh, where their immune system is not working properly or where there have been major breaches in the physiological and anatomical defenses against infection, these organisms can cause disease. Uh, so you just have to walk uh, a few hundred yards up the road to the hospital to see these kind of pathogens in action where patients who are highly vulnerable in the hospital will get many of these kind of infections. In terms of the severity of disease, it's worth stressing uh, that uh, this depends on the virulence of the pathogen and the infectious dose that you receive of the pathogen. Uh, and the more virulent the pathogen, the smaller the infectious dose that you need to establish infection and cause disease. So if we take, take a mouse model of infection, uh, we need about 10 to the 2 of an organism like Streptococcus pneumoniae. That's all we need to actually kill 100% of mice. We take 10 mice or 20 mice and we inject that in, all of them will die at that dose. But to achieve the same effect with something like Salmonella enterica, Cerevar typhimurium, we, we actually have to give a much larger dose, say 10 to the 6, before uh, we achieve that result. Term pathogenesis is applied to the processes leading to infection to the level of uh, tissues, cells, molecules. Um, and another term that's sometimes used in this field is the term virulence factor. Now this is a bit of a weasel word. It can be defined in various different ways, um, but in kind of general terms we could say it's something that contributes to the ability of a microbe to cause disease. Uh, and we'll say more about the fuzziness of this definition later in the, in the talk. Um, pathogens obviously get into your body from various different uh, portals, through various different portals. Uh, the mucous membranes of the gut, respiratory tract, uh, genitourinary tract, or, um, other examples maybe say the conjunctiva. Uh, these provide one portal of entry. The skin, intact skin actually is a very good barrier to infection. Uh, but once the skin is broken, if you have a wound, uh, then this provides a portal of entry for bacteria. Uh, some microorganisms obviously get through the skin by biting arthropods as well as another way of getting into the body. Um, and then parenterally, uh, through uh, directly into the bloodstream, this is something we see um, when we actually put in bits of plastic, cath uh, cannulas, catheters into the blood, uh, and uh, we give, let's say, blood products, transfusions, those kind of things can actually act as a source of pathogens. Now coming back again to this term virulence factor, it's, it's a slightly slippery type kind of term. Um, and there, there is some ambiguity out there because if you look at, let's say we call a virulence factor anything necessary to, to cause disease. In fact, it turns out that many of the things uh, that are necessary to cause disease are also required to colonize the body surfaces. So let's say an E. coli is going to cause disease. Well, to get to the stage of being able to cause disease, it has to be able to survive in the gut in the first place. It has to be able to get to the site where it's going to cause disease. So there is this ambiguity. Do we bundle in all those things that are required to colonize, say, the bowel in the case of E. coli? or um, tissues, the skin in the case of Staph aureus or whatever? Uh, or do we only describe things that are actually a kind of aggressive virulence factors that are there damaging host tissues? Um, and people have tended to use a much broader term, a broader definition of virulence factor lately, 
to talk about everything involved in that uh, process of pathogenesis and colonization pathogenesis. Now, one um, definition that actually has brought some clarity to the field, has been widely adopted, was put forward by uh, Stan Falco, one of the great kind of godfathers of bacterial pathogenesis back in the like, late 1980s. Uh, what he called molecular Cox postulates, what some people are now calling Falco's post postulates. Um, and what he said was, if you take a specific gene uh, that, you see, you, that you think might be a virulence factor, what you should see is that it's present in all the things that are causing a particular disease, uh, all the, all, all the, the strains, uh, all the lineages, of bacterial lineages that are associated with that particular infection or that particular phenotype. So it may be that you're actually looking in a very kind of reductionist way, say, looking at hemolysis and saying, oh, so what's causing this hemolysis? It might not be the whole infection, maybe something you see in the lab. But if you see there's an association, then you knock out that gene uh, using uh, molecular approaches, genetic engineering, uh, the dominant DNA technology, and then that virulence phenotype should go away. So either the whole thing, if you're, say, sticking something to a mouse and seeing if the mouse dies, or if you're looking at a phenomenon in the lab like hemolysis, that should disappear. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's it then. Isn't that proof? Well, the trouble is that when we do manipulation of bacteria, genetic manipulation in the lab, in fact, even just when we propagate bacteria in the lab, sometimes they acquire mutations anyway, just by chance, uh, unintended mutations. And so to be absolutely certain uh, that the, the phenotype we see is the, uh, the changing phenotype, is the result of the mutation we've made in, the, in the inactivating that gene, we then have to put that gene back in again, reintroduce it into the, in, into the cell. Uh, and this can be either put back into the chromosome or it can be put onto a plasmid. Once it goes back in again, the bacterium should regain that virulence phenotype. Um, and um, we should see some, may not be complete restoration of virulence, but at least uh, a good way towards the wild type uh, phenotype. Now, in some bacteria, you can't do genetic manipulation, um, and uh, therefore, you might have to look at some proxy that you can look at antibodies. So, so you raised antibodies against a particular protein, and then you saw that that stopped hemolysis when you applied those antibodies. But in general, if we can go through and do this, knock the gene out, see the phenotype change, put the gene back in again, see the phenotype restored, this is considered good practice and, and kind of the minimum specification for defining a virulence factor in this way. But as I say, it's a very kind of, over, it's a kind of fuzzy and slightly overhyped concept. We, we, people throw around the term virulence factor in their grant proposals and papers and so forth because it's kind of very sexy. In, in a way, I, I would make an analogy uh, with the term weapon or offensive weapon. I mean, in, in, in Britain, it's illegal for you to walk along the street with an offensive weapon. But what is an offensive weapon? I mean, if you walk along the street with a with an Uzi, uh, then I guess that's obvious. Yeah, you're carrying a weapon. But if you're a young woman and you're carrying a comb, which happens to have one of those you know, metal long extensions off the other end that you could use to stab an attacker, is that an offensive weapon? If you, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to draw lines. And the same is true here of virulence factors. And, and in a sense, we, we should argue that, uh, what, you know, if we want to ask this question, what is a virulence factor? We say, well, why do you want to know? You kind of define it operationally. Why are we interested in knowing whether this is a virulence factor? And there are various reasons we, we might want to know. We might want to be developing a vaccine or developing a new drug, and that will lead us to one definition of virulence. Um, so if we want a drug, we just need to have a, a target which is a, essential for survival in the host. And, and generally, most drugs actually... Uh, attack targets that are essential for, for survival in any environment, let, not, let alone just the host. Um, we may be looking at novel diagnostics, we may be looking at an evolutionary perspective. I mean, putting this more generally, uh, there's a, there was a lively, I think it still is a lively debate, uh, uh, certainly 10, 15 years ago, about whether things like cryptography count as a weapon. Um, and so strong cryptography in the US is actually defined as a munition. And if you uh, export uh, algorithms from the US to other countries that allow them to encrypt data securely, then you can be charged with exporting a weapon. 
Um, and a lot of geeky people then started wearing out with little T-shirts and deliberately walking through um, airports with that on to sort of provoke the system. But you can see that it's, again, it's this kind of fuzzy thing. Um, and obviously, you can look at, if you say, well, everything that's required to colonize or in, uh, in, uh, cause infection in the host is a virulence factor, it's not the ribosomes required for that. You're going to define the ribosome as a virulence factor. If you interfere with ribosomal um, function, then you might slow down growth. That might have an effect on virulence. You know? So I, I think it's important that you get clear that, that this isn't clear and that, that these are fuzzy terms and, and you don't get uh, too, too wound up on that. Even if we take simplistic views uh, of virulence, though, we can go a long way. So if we take a simplistic view that infections are war, if you like, it's a war of bacteria against us. We made this kind of analogy with, with weapons already. Um, and some of the toxins that produced, are produced by bacteria, if you just purify them, you know, soluble proteins, if you purify them and inject them into an animal, you will get same kind of features uh, in terms of clinical features that you would get from the infection as a whole. And there are several examples of this. If we took tetanus toxin and purified it, injected it into an animal, the animal would experience the same kind of paralysis that they would have got through infection with uh, tetanus. And, and there's a whole list of others there. And even though we might say, well, it's a bit simplistic, just looking at this as you know, the weaponry, um, actually purifying those toxins and then inactivating them as toxins, uh, but then delivering them to the immune system did lead to a spectacular advance. So these so-called toxoids, these inactivated toxins, led to a spectacular decline in the in instance of many bacterial infections. I'll show you one in a moment. Um, so, you know, if given that this has so, been so successful, certainly in the early 20th century, late 19th and early 20th century, this was very successful, you could argue that all that you require for virulence is just to produce some toxins. Now that is, is actually a, a simplistic view, and it's, it's, it's analogous to just kind of all you need to do to create war is to throw a bomb at someone. Um, this just shows you, though, that this simplistic view does work. It has some value, and this is what happened to diphtheria after the introduction of toxoid vaccination. Uh, the number of cases in the country plummeted, and the number of deaths uh, plummeted, and so now uh, we hardly ever see this. We don't see any natural endemic diphtheria here. We see occasional importation from other parts of the world, but you can count on the fingers of one hand, usually the number of cases you'll see in a year, and in fact often there'll be several years where you don't get any at all. So we now take a kind of more sophisticated view, sort of towards, you know, the last 25 years, 30 years, since Falco started making that definition and looking at things, we start to realize that actually, if we want to understand the whole of virulence and pathogenesis, we need to look more widely. And we need to think about virulence as a multifactorial process. Um, and if you like, the, your bacterial army, like a human army, doesn't just depend on, on the weaponry it's carrying, but it also needs lots of other things. Uh, it needs to enter and secure enemy territory. Uh, there's a quote from Napoleon, an army marches on its stomach. So bacteria need to actually get nutrients, they need to survive in, in the environments they're going into long enough for them to actually then release their weaponry and cause disease or provoke uh, responses, host responses that cause disease. Um, so you, you can look at this soldier here, he's got, he's camouflaging himself with his, with his uh, uniform there, he's got protective uh, protective helmet there to protect himself from damage. He's carrying supplies on his back so he can, uh, to keep him going. And, you know, and he does happen to have a gun there as well, but that's part of the whole package. The other thing about virulence is we now recognise it's a, a multidimensional thing. It's not like one thing, just boom, that's it, virulence has happened, just infections there. If you look, say, take an E. coli, that's going to cause, you, give you diarrhoea, E. coli has to go into your mouth, has to survive inside your mouth and saliva, it goes down into your into the acid bath of your stomach, and it has to be able to survive in that acid bath of your stomach, comes out of the stomach, then it's going to get all that bile chucked on top of it, uh, and it's going to have to survive that as well. So at various stages in, in, in that cycle of infection, 
you're going to have different genes, different virulence factors, different colonization factors deployed by the organism. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just take you through some of the steps, just to flesh out this idea of, of, of um, multifactorial, of the multifactorial nature of virulence, the multidimensional nature, the fact that it's, it happens in time and space. Um, and to make it easy for you to remember, um, I've put everything beginning with S here. So these steps in successful infection, everything begins with, uh, with an S. And we'll go through these and just illustrate some of the points as we go along. So, start with bacterial sex, uh, bacteria exchange DNA. Um, if we want to look at the, the, the kind of lineages of bacteria, we can do that now with molecular phylogeny. Um, and, um, you know, back in the, as late as the 1970s, people would just throw their hands up and say, well, you can't classify bacteria in a kind of proper way like you can with plants and animals. Well, you can now because we have molecular techniques, we use sequences. And there are practical consequences of this. We use this now, uh, these kind of approaches to identify bacteria that we can't culture or difficult to culture. An early one was uh, an organism called Trophoema whippoli, which caused uh, an infection of the intestine called Whipple's disease. Although it grows to very large numbers in the intestine of patients suffering from the infection, uh, you, can't, you couldn't until uh, recently grow it in the laboratory. But nonetheless, it was possible to identify it um, using uh, molecular methods, typically based on these ribosomal RNA sequences uh, used as kind of molecular barcodes. But another interesting feature of, uh, we'll say more about this when we talk about genomes, in terms of uh, what, what we've learned in, in recent days, that actually, although we like the idea of a tidy hierarchy of a, a family tree, in fact, what's happening in bacteria is there's this massive horizontal gene transfer so although genes, most of the genomes being passed down from, from um, parent cell to progeny cell, if you like, there is also uh, lots of stuff that comes in horizontally on, on uh, plasmids and, uh, and phages and so forth. And some people have said, well, we shouldn't talk about tree of life, we should talk about net of life. Um, we should think about genomes as mosaics of kind of the core genome and this accessory stuff coming in. In terms of our bacterial sex, how do, how do bacteria get DNA, how do they exchange DNA? Well, we have basically three approaches which bacteria can use. And again, probably you've, those of you who've done genetic work. So we have bacterial sex, so transformation. So uh, when the cells lie, they release DNA. Other cells uh, in the same species can take that DNA up and then it can be recombined into their genome. So for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae, the pneumococcus, uh, does this all the time, it's releasing DNA and taking up DNA. Transduction is the process where, as you see at the bottom here, where phages uh, package up bits of DNA uh, from one cell and then take it into another. Um, they can either package up their own uh, DNA and carry within the phage genome interesting virulence genes, we'll say more about that in a moment, or they can, in some cases, they can package up bits of the chromosome and allow that to move from one cell to another. And then conjugation is where the cells actually make, this is the closest we get to bacterial sex, if you like. They actually have uh, an apparatus that allows DNA, the cells to come together and DNA to move from one to another. These are usually uh, driven by, this is driven by plasmids and usually drives the plasmid from one cell to another. In rare cases, uh, it can actually be used to move a whole chromosome from one cell to another in so-called uh, high-frequency uh, recombination mutants. Another uh, key feature of, of the exchange of DNA between bacteria is the movement of mobile genetic elements. Um, so these can move around, they can move sometimes within the same genome from one place to another. So transposons, so jumping genes, can move from one part of a genome to another. But they can also move from, say, a chromosome onto a plasmid, from one plasmid onto another plasmid, and so on. So they very kind of cut and paste themselves uh, uh, from one place to another. And there are many examples, we'll say more about this in the genetic lecture of this, uh, where, where virulence factors are carried on transposons. You can also have the so-called virulence plasmids, which carry uh, whole stacks of virulence genes encoding uh, complex systems involved in virulence. 
and then bacteriophage can also um, encode virulence factors. So um, again, for those of you not done genetics, you, you may or may not be aware that bacteriophage, uh, they act as, as bacterial viruses, they can infect cells, and in, in um, some cases they take over the cell, they just turn the cell into a phage making factory and burst the cell open. But in other cases, uh, they can sometimes integrate their, their, their own genome into the genome of the cell and live within the cell quite happily for many, many generations, um, so-called so lysogeny. And in that sort of situation where they're living inside the chromosome, they can actually contribute to the cell by encoding virulence factors. Um, so it just illustrates the point here. We're into the cell, and then that uh, genome gets integrated into the chromosome and becomes what's known in the jargon as a prophage. Um, and an uh, you know, interesting example from my own work, a few years ago we discovered that these prophages like this we're actually encoding a large number of virulence factors uh, in uh, E. coli 0157, particularly nasty forms of E. coli. And this figure here just shows you the various phases around the genome uh, that were carrying virulence factors. And this is just the very end of a phage genome. And one end is this kind of like pasture compartment. Those genes that are shown in green there are actually virulence associated genes that are carried by the phage. Another key concept we need to get across is the idea of pathogenicity islands. Uh, so this idea originated from the study of europathogenic E. coli strains uh, back in the early 1990s by Jörg uh, Hacker and his colleagues. What they found when they were studying E. coli, particularly the kinds of E. coli that cause urinary tract infections, was that there were these so-called hemolysin islands. So there's a hemolysin associated with this particular virulence uh, property. Um, and they found that those, when you culture the cells, uh, the bacterial cells in the laboratory, that hemolysis was lost, uh, and part, what was happening was part of the chromosome was being deleted. But then they found that actually they weren't just losing the hemolysis, they were also losing another virulence factor, these so-called p-fimbri, which are adhesins. And so you were getting a loss of two different virulence uh, factors at the same time. And so they said, well, we'll call these pathogenicity islands. Uh, and basically what they amount to is that these large blocks of genetic material that provide, uh, if you like, for the cell a quantum leap up to a novel complex phenotype. So instead of the cell having to say it wants to build a virulence factor that has 20 different components, instead of it having to acquire each of those genes one at a time in 20 different steps, it can just acquire all 20 genes in one block as a pathogenicity animal. Um, so this, this concept's now been applied to many different bacterial species uh, and there are all sorts of things encoded on these virulence factors, toxins, secretion systems, ciprofors, adhesins and so forth. Um, it's turned out though that path, the, the term pathogenicity island is, is also a bit like virulence factors, a fuzzy term. It's, it, at the margins it starts to sort of kind of grey out a bit, and it's uncertain how far you should push it. But in general, we, we defining characteristics according to Hacker is that we have carriage of many virulence genes together in one locus. Uh, that these uh, pathogenic ions are found in the pathogenic strains that have a particular pathogenic phenotype, but not in the non-pathogenic strains. An interesting feature is that they have a different GC content generally from the host chromosome. So if you think about the way DNA works, A always pairs with T, G always pairs with C. So the amount of G in a, in a, in a, in a genome is always going to be the same as the amount of C. But in fact, the amount of G plus C, or the amount of A plus T, actually can vary independently. So you can have some genomes where they make use of, in their codons, instead of, if they have, uh, say, encoding, lyse, uh, encoding glycine, they might have GGA and GGT used preferentially. In other genomes, they might use GGG and GGC preferentially because there's this redundancy in genetic code. And so what that means is you get different GC contents uh, in different genomes. And there is a kind of general average GC content for the host chromosome. But these pathogenicity islands tend to deviate from that. So if you go and you 
set a sliding window and just measure the GC content of the genome, these regions tend to scream out at you as being different. They tend to occupy large chromosomal regions, we're talking tens or even hundreds of kilobases, uh, but they tend to be compact. Right? They can generally have virulence genes associated with one particular phenotype or a couple of phenotypes, but not all sorts of other nonsense in there as well. Um, sometimes they're flanked by direct repeats or that they insert themselves into tRNAs. Um, and there may be mobility genes associated with them. This is not always the case. Um, but sometimes you see integrases, similar to the kind of integrases you see in profiles associated with these uh, pathogens tRNAs. Interestingly, one of the, the, the features that kind of first brought them to, to the attention of, uh, of the microbial research community is one that's actually not quite not that common, and this is the idea of uh, 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 the fact that they're instable, instability, and prone to deletion. In fact, that's not true for many of them. It was true for the initial hemolysin island, but it's not true generally. Here's um, perhaps, well, I would say my favourite pathogen the island. This is a so-called locus for enterocyte effacement, or LE. It's a pathogen the island found in enteropathogenic and enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and you'll be learning more about that later in the course. This encodes a particular type of secretion system known as a type 3 secretion system. But you can see a couple of interesting features here. Uh, if you look at the top there, we have GC content here for the genes in, the chrom in that part of the chromosome. We've got a spectrum here, a color spectrum. So uh, uh, the low GC is shown as green, the average and high GC is shown as yellow and red, respectively. And you can see you go from a kind of yellowish, uh, occasional bits of orange, through to an area which is entirely green, which is the, 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 uh, the Lee that has this deviation in GC content, uh, having a much lower GC content than the rest of the genome. It also shows this interesting character. Here we have, in this cartoon, we have E. coli 0157 at the top, and we have K12, which is a harmless commensal E. coli that is commonly used in the laboratory. And you can see that this locus ventricite effacement is, has gone into the, the 0157 genome and is missing entirely from the, the K12 genome. Uh, so it's a discrete block of genes that have been kind of plonked into the genome. Okay, enough about uh, bacterial genetics. We're going to go into more detail on that later. The import, another important uh, feature of virulence of pathogens that we have to recognise is that they have to sense the environment. They're not just these kind of dumb drones are just going in into the body and just doing their stuff without any interaction. Uh, they're, exqui they're exquisitely sensitive to what's going on around them in the environment. They're sensing the changes. If you like, think of them as a kind of cruise missile that's actually plotting where it's going at all times, taking a, land a look at the landscape, working out where it is. Um, uh, and so, you know, coming back to that E. coli I mentioned earlier, you swallow, it goes into your stomach. Once it gets into the stomach, it has to be sensing immediately, ah, oh, it's in an uh, acidic environment. It's turning on acid stress response genes and so forth. So in the simplest cases, we, we actually get very simple uh, changes in, in concentrations of irons. I mean, you mentioned iron. Uh, in, diph in the case of diphtheria, if you have a low iron concentration and you get a um, release of repression of the diphtheria toxin gene, the diphtheria toxin gene is turned on, you get production of, of diphtheria. Um, and the rationale for that is that in um, the body fluids, we have very low iron levels, so it's, it, the organism is sensing that it's in an appropriate environment to release the toxin. Um, in more complex cases, and again, we'll say more about this in genetics, actually, you have these whole comp uh, signal transduction cascades where the bacterium is taking multiple inputs from the environment and integrating them all and coming up with um, some response to that complex environment. So the pathogen is like a computer, it's like a cruise missile, it's, it's, it's an information processor. Um, and uh, the result of all that sensing is that you're, the, the bacterium is then able to switch virulence factors on and off. Um, so back, the, the pathogens are not just putting all their genes on, switching them all on at the same time, making everything it could possibly make all at the same time. This would be wasteful, obviously, to start making things that are not actually going to be used in that environment, are not useful. And in fact, it, uh, people have shown that if you, if you force on 
some of these genes involved in virulence um, so that they're always on. In the, in the say, whole animal model, you actually can see a decrease in virulence because uh, they're, they're actually being switched on in the environments where they're not useful, um, as well as being switched on in environments where they are useful. One of the key terms that we use to describe uh, the process of gene regulation is, is coordinate gene regulation. So again, it's, it's not that we're coming back to the idea that you don't acquire one gene at a time 20 times to get 20 genes. Similarly, you're not regulating every gene separately, completely, uh, with its own uh, regulatory systems and so forth. You're actually coordinately regulating uh, multiple genes. Um, and the simplest example of that is the, is the operon, where you have a string of genes in a row, all responding, uh, it's being under the control of a single promoter. Um, but at more uh, uh, kind of higher levels, we, we talk about things like stimulons, we talk about the response to a given stimulus, all the, 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 the genes that are changing their gene expression in response to that stimulus. Um, sometimes we call this a stress response, well, stress response. So yeah, if we took a, an E. coli and dunked it into some hydrogen peroxide, it would make a, an oxidative stress response. Now, we may also talk about a regulon. So all the genes that are regulated by a given regulator is known as the regulon for that regulator. So um, OxyR is an example of a regulator that responds to oxidative stress. It's not the only regulator, but all the genes that are uh, responsive to the effects of OxyR are called, make up the OxyR regulon. Um, and as I say, we have this coordinate regulation of virulence in response to in vivo signals, to what's going on in, in the host environment. Again, we're going to say more about this in a, in a subsequent lecture, but we have a whole range of, uh, there's a hierarchy of change in virulence gene expression, uh, changes in, gene, in DNA sequence, changes in trans translational regulation, and so forth. Uh, here's a, an example of a complex uh, regulatory system. This is the so called Toxar Regulon in Vibrio Colliery. So we have these environmental signals up there, pH, osmolarity, temperature, bile, amino acids, carbon dioxide, regulating what's going on in the cell. There's a particular regulator, Toxar, um, and this is uh, talking in a, a very complex way, lots of feedback loops and loops going on there, um, and producing outputs in terms of um, adhesins, production of the cholera toxin, all in a, a very sophisticated way. And this is an, actually a fairly simplified version of how these things work. Swim, well, many bacterial pathogens are motile. They have swimming motility. It's crucial for virulence in some cases. It's known that ascending urinary tract infection where the bacteria get from the bladder up into the kidneys, they require flagella motility to do that. Uh, in many other cases, although the bacteria is motile, we I haven't quite got clear that it's really the motility that's essential, but it probably it is in many situations. A uh, usual organelle for motility in bacteria is the bacterial flagellum, which you can see here, and you will be getting a full lecture on this later in the course. There are some other variants of swimming motility, twitching motility, and swarming. I'll like say more about those just now. Once you've actually got to where you want to be as a bacterium causing disease, you have to stick around. And if you think about it, one of the usual responses of the body, protective uh, physiological uh, responses of the body, is to actually wash things away uh, and out of the system. So in your lungs and in your respiratory tract, you have this mucociliary escalator that is pushing in small particles, catching them up in the mucus, pushing it up uh, uh, and out of the lungs and respiratory tract, and then you cough it up and swallow it. Um, similarly, in the bowel, the movement of uh, the peristalsis, the movement of feces through the bowel and so forth, that's pushing bacteria out. Um, and in the urinary tract, you know, washing bacteria out of the urinary tract with the flow of urine. So to overcome those kind of things, bacteria need to stick around. Um, and they can either stick to mucosal surfaces, external matrix, sometimes they stick to solid surfaces. So, uh, for example, strep mutans, which causes dental caries, is sticking to your teeth. And it has to be able to stick to your teeth to cause caries. 
uh, to, ha to stick around. Um, uh, the, um, uh, another bacterium, Actinomyces, also uses um, fimbri. Um, and in fact, this is piggybacking on this, this dextran glycocalyx that's produced by strip mutans um, as a way of sticking to the teeth. So it's borrowing uh, something from another bacterium. So there are multiple kind of levels of, of interaction here between bacteria, adhesins, um, uh, and, and host uh, tissues. So you can get direct interaction with host receptors. You can get this kind of molecular bridging so that um, bacteria might bind to fibronectin and then the fibronectin binds to its normal receptors on host cells. Um, and in the most sophisticated cases, you can get an interaction between the bacterium and the host cell that involves not just adherence, but and lots of manipulation of the host cell phys uh, physiology, you know, signal transduction pathways, cytoskeleton, and so forth. And we'll say more about that later in, in later in the course. Scavenging nutrients is also very important. Um, one of the hallmarks are of your body fluids is that they contain very, very, very low levels of free iron. Um, and this is a way in which we prevent the growth of bacteria in, in body fluids because we're actually starving them of iron. And if you get what we call the acute phase response, if you start to get a bit fluey, uh, you start to get temperature um, as part of that res response that the body makes, you find that iron levels drop even lower in, in body fluids. And we know that if you overload people with iron, it can increase their susceptibility to infection. So there are some people that have multiple transfusions and they get iron overload and they're more susceptible to certain infections, particularly, say, with your senior uh, than the average person. In fact, bacteria are very sophisticated in terms of scavenging iron. They have all sorts of different systems. Um, the term siderophore is used for molecules which, uh, small molecules produced by bacteria which collate the available iron and then transport it back into the bacteria. Uh, the iron can be scavenged uh, directly from, from the fluids, from, t from, from, from the external milieu, but actually some bacteria can then go and rip it out of iron binding proteins that the host makes. So you have things like lactoferrin, transferrin in your, in, in, in your body fluids, and some bacteria can actually bind those proteins and then rip the iron out of them. There's usually coordinate regulation of the response to iron starvation. In E. coli, there's a, a gene called FUR, which regulates uh, the iron stress response, um, iron starvation stress response. Uh, and there are many homologues and, and, and analogues of this in other systems as well. Some pathogens are very sophisticated. They actually just get rid of the requirement for iron. So when the, uh, the organism that causes syphilis, treponema paladin, when its, paladin, when its genome was sequenced, people looked at all the enzymes that it encoded, and, and they noticed that actually none of them were using iron in their active sites. So it was swapping out. If there was an alternative that used manganese or some other iron, it would use that instead. And so this organism is capable of surviving in the body for decades, hiding away, uh, partly because it, it's cut out the need for iron. And as we've touched on already, iron levels are actually used to regulate aggressive virulence factors. So there's three examples there of toxins that are actually regulated by low iron levels in response that the toxin genes are switched on, the toxins are made when there is low iron environments. Kind of hinted about this already, stress is another theme in, in, in bacterial pathogenesis. So when the pathogens are going in uh, to body tissues, they are experiencing stress. So when we grow them in the laboratory, it's like the Garden of Eden, or paradise for bacteria. They, they're growing at 37 degrees, they're getting lots of nutrients. It's a wonderful environment for them. Actually, life in the host is nothing like that at all. The host is actually trying to destroy them. It's trying to stress them as much as possible. So you mentioned the acid stress of the stomach, the acid bath that you, you have. Uh, when you swallow food, anything that's in that food is going to get dunked into that acid bath straight away. Fever, taking back bacterial pathogens that say you like to live at 37, making it live at 39, maybe it might top tip the balance. There's a lot of lively debate actually about whether 
fever is an adaptive response and quite how useful it is and so forth. Within phagocytes, you basically are throwing oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen radicals at <coughs> pathogens as part of the uh, response there. And interestingly, when I first came into microbiology about 30 years ago, a uh, big theme was that looking at, uh, let's see what antigens are recognized when during an infection. Uh, and we thought, oh, you'd find loads of toxins and adhesins and so forth. But in fact, say we're looking at TB, what you found was that the actual antibody response to TB is predominated by, dominated by uh, um, stress response proteins, particularly chaperonins, which are uh, proteins which refold proteins that have become unfolded during a, uh, uh, some kind of stress, heat shock, or some other stress that is unfolding proteins. Uh, and there are other detoxification proteins out there as well that play a role in virulence, coping with, say, uh, superoxide dismutases, getting rid of superoxide uh, radicals uh, and protecting the cell from that. And we know, you know, this is a generally important facet because if you take away the stress for the bacteria, they, they are able to cause disease more readily. So many people now are taking acid suppressive medication um, we know that if you lose acid production in your stomach, the infectious dose for pathogens uh, goes down quite dramatically. So the dose needed to, say, establish an E. coli diarrhea or Shigella or whatever, when you're not or Campylobacter, when you're not taking, when you're not producing acid, is much lower. Um, so it's clear that that is an adaptive thing. Stealth, we mentioned camouflage earlier. Stealth is also important. Um, there are a variety of different ways in which the organisms can avoid the host defences, particularly even those of the, the, the uh, acquired immune uh, system. Uh, we've got the talloproteases, which specifically chew up IgA, uh, these are called IgA proteases. Uh, Staph aureus produces a protein called protein A, which specifically binds to immunoglobulins. But as shown in this cartoon here, it's actually binding the wrong end of the immunoglobulin. So the part of the immunoglobulin that should be coming and neutralizing the, the bacterium is actually just being held flapping around um, and the immunoglobulin binding protein is binding to the other end and, and, and uh, sequestering it away from where it can do any damage to the cell. Bacteria in host tissues have to, uh, and in the, in the circulation, have to resist complements, they have to resist opsonization. And many of them produce capsules, particularly if they're going through a, uh, a phase where they're replicating extensively in the blood, they produce a capsule which protects them against the effects of complement. Um, other surface features also play a role. And in, in, in tuberculosis, uh, the cell wall of the organism is so complex and so resilient, that's protecting uh, the, the bacterium as well. Some bacteria actually are kind of have hooks by, if you like, they are really, they not only overcome the host defences, but they make their home right in the heartland of the enemy. So some of them will actually live inside phagocytes um, and uh, adopt that as a niche. Some of them will also hunker down into what we call biofilms, so the streptococcus mutans on your teeth is producing a biofilm that's sticking down. Similar things happen if, say, bacteria get on a heart valve, they will stick down and cause a biofilm. And then they become much less accessible to host defences. So antibodies and cellular responses can't actually penetrate the biofilm. Um, antigenic mimicry. So some bacteria produce molecules that mimic uh, uh, host molecules. So you've all been vaccinated, I think, uh, against group C meningococcus. Uh, that has, in the last decade or so, removed about half of the causes, or half of the cases of meningitis in the community. But there is still group B meningococcus out there. And we don't have a vaccine against that that relies on the capsule, because the capsule from uh, group B is actually made of cyanic acid, which is found all over your um, cells and uh, it means that you're, you, you can't make an immune response to it. And if we actually broke the tolerance and, and did vaccinate you against group B meningococcus in that way, we might actually provoke autoimmunity. So this is still a, a big problem. We have also antigenic diversity, lots of different uh, side chains in different uh, bacteria. 
to move on a bit faster. We get phase variation where things change a lot. Uh, the kind of method changing its spots, answering on surface, uh, keep changing. Um, various mechanisms there. Uh, this is one example from Campylobacter jujunai, where we have um, these runs of what we call homopolymer uh, peaks, where we've got lots of Gs in a row, we've got eight Gs in a row, and then this keeps changing to nine Gs or seven Gs in a row. Um, and this is putting up the, 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 the protein uh, that they're in, in and out of frame, and turning it in on, on and off very rapidly. So you have this whole mixed population varying uh, all the time. And then the last part of the talk, really, the last couple of bits, uh, we talk about strike back. So we damage host, tox uh, host tissues. Two major issues here, endotoxin and exotoxins. Um, endotoxin is a component of the cell wall um, of gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it's it's uh, made up of lipopolysaccharide. So there's this lipid A part, which is the toxic part, and then there's, this is coated with poor polysaccharide on the own side chain. <coughs> and this is the actual part that does damage it. It provokes a response in the body. You get pyrotistic, you get fever, uh, you get a decrease in, in, in white cells in the blood, and then it, it rebounds and you get more of them. And in severe cases, you get uh, hypotension, so called gram negative or endotoxic shock. Um, and this is a life, compli a life threatening complication of septicemia that you get in, say, meningococcal disease. Um, you get it in the intensive care unit patients. Sometimes they'll just drop their blood pressure um, and be very sick indeed. So one of my colleagues, in fact, at the moment, her father just presented over Christmas uh, in gram-negative shock because he had a UTI and he's actually in the hospital at the moment. So this is clearly a clear and present problem. Um, in days gone by, it also used to be a problem when people were using intravenous equipment for the first time because if you could sterilise, say, your giving sets, but unless you got rid of every bit of endotoxin as well, when you ran in, say, some saline, you'd run in endotoxin, the patient would spike a fever. But luckily, we've now kind of got around that. Exotoxins, what are these? These are secreted proteins that have enzymatic activity. They transport into body fluids. There are various effects they can have on cells, cytotoxins, neurotoxins, enterotoxins. We mentioned the use of, uh, of uh, toxoids as vaccines. Here's some, a fairly gruesome picture showing the effect of one of these. Uh, this is the effect of Clostridium perfringens alpha toxin causing gas gangrene in a patient. Uh, it chews up membranes. But there are other examples there. And some of these are actually, we have turned to our own advantage. So, so uh, things that break down clots, kinases, these are being used now as, uh, uh, in the, through recombinant engineering, these have been turned into recombinant DNA, genetic engineering, these have been turned into useful therapeutic projects uh, that we can use uh, in treatment. But they also play a role in, in, in disease in certain situations. Uh, some, there are pore forming toxins that punch holes in cells. Um, a particular example, two, two examples of families there, the so called RTX family um, and these so called thiol activated. Uh, um, cytotoxins produced by gram positive. So one the party is predominantly gram negative. There are these metalloendoproteases, uh, particularly botulinum toxin, tetanus toxin, which affect the ner nervous system dominantly. Um, and you get, uh, in one case, you get flaccid paralysis, in the other case, you get spastic paralysis, um, depending on which part, uh, just quite how subtly they influence the immune system. And then there are a whole range of toxins active inside cells, and many of these come in the form of AB toxins, where they have an active subunit and then a binding subunit. So here's diphtheria toxin, which is an example of this. Its enzymatic part is an ADP ribosyl transferase, uh, but it also has a binding domain as well. And the more sophisticated forms of these are so-called AB5 toxins, where they have an active subunit at the top, and then they have five binding subunits that form this kind of docking unit that actually docks onto the cell. Um, and then there are these, uh, another class of toxins you just mentioned in passing, are the pyrogenic exotoxins, uh, so-called super antigens that activate T cells um, and cause disease. And toxic shock syndrome toxin is an example of that. Secrete and subvert, I mentioned earlier about uh, the subversion of cells as part of the adhesion process. We're going to talk much more about this later in the course. I won't uh, 
spend too much time on this, but basically many uh, bacteria produce very complex secretion systems that actually dock onto cells and then inject uh, so-called effector molecules to subvert the cells. Um, survival within cells, we mentioned intracellular survival before within phagocytes and various ways in which the bacteria can manipulate uh, signaling pathways to survive in cells. And then they've got to spread through cells and organs. So, for example, the organism that causes typhoid fever gets inside macrophages and spreads. They can spread through the blood, they have to be complement resistant. This here is an example of a bacterium listeria that's actually moving through the cytoplasm on a tail of actin. So they manipulate the uh, actin cytoskeleton and allow them to sort of push through cells and from one cell into another. Last uh, couple of slides now. So scattering is important. So how do bacteria as pathogens, they have to get out of the host and get into another host. Uh, and there are a whole range of ways in which they can do that. Um, scattering, so the established dogma is that there's a balanced pathogenicity, that pathogens don't cause too much virulence, because if they kill their host, then they can't get out of their host. It's best to be, but that's not entirely true. Anyway, we'll, we can talk about that more in a later lecture. So I've taken you through all those different S's, and I think we need to get out of here now. So. Uh, remember there's a Facebook page, remember to like, hit the slide pass, slide share, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. Thank you.